Yeah, you can start. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, is a screen shape? Not yet, I guess. Just a second. Hello, you have to uh, uh, enable me to share the screen. Srinivas Garu. Yeah, you can share screen now. I made you co-host. Is it? All right. Okay. All right. Welcome all for the, for the fifth session of this uh, series called Re Rediscovering the Roots of Indian Civilization. Uh, we have seen various uh, sessions. The first one is about the discovery of land, second, which, which talks about the nativity of Indians and how long back they have settled in India and how they migrate to different parts of the world. We have talked about in the second session, the cultural evolution in the Indian context. The third is the spiritual, the rise in spiritualism which talks about how the Indian subcontinent, the culture of India has a unifying uh, philosophical unity in different forms of its activity. For example, in arts, in dance, in music, in architecture, in, uh, in literary sources. So there is a common chord of that spiritual connectivity across this uh, Indian subcontinent. The fourth one we've seen is the the, the human heart entanglement of ancient, uh, na uh, ancient natives across the world, world natives. So we have seen yesterday that session that how the natives, native civilizations across the world flourished till 15th century and uh, how they, uh, the modes of their uh, uh, existence and the practice of their language and the customs seriously got disrupted due to the colonization. And we have seen how the India, though it's a native civilization, how it um, rebounded to its, uh, without losing its own track of civilizational continuity. And uh, we have seen that in yesterday. Today's session will be more about how from last uh, approximately 80 years since independence, how India, I mean, uh, and the world, how the, the ideas, um, uh, what we thought will do good, how, how it rebounded back to us, uh, and uh, how the Western media or media in general portrays India, the image of India. And we will see uh, how true is in those uh, in those uh, images and the caricature they make, and uh, and uh, we will try to find out where we went wrong in uh, in uh, developing our own society. So that's the topic of today, which is the allure tragedy. So in today's case, we will uh, recapitulate the, what we have become by our own self-imposed choices, trends, and ideologies. We will see where such ideologies are leading us uh, as, as an Indian and as a humanity. And uh, what we have gained by these choices and what we have lost in this process of achieving in a uh, uh, highly evolved technological utopian world. So, uh, and we will try to realize, uh, try to assess, are we on the right track? by the choices what we make and the world we are creating every day. So uh, generally when you see a newspaper in the, in, in the media, you will get a notion from last 70 years, the notion of India is as if it's a beggar, uh, bug and uh, beggar infested uh, and poor, poor nation, which is India. So that's a general context till you see across uh, the the leading newspapers across the world from North America to BBC and, 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 uh, and Middle Eastern newspapers and so on. So if the India was poor, a bug uh, and a beg infested, let us see what India uh, is doing in terms of agricultural products. 
So India became the largest producer of all these agricultural products. For example, fruits, lemons, milk, castor oil, seeds, different kind of uh, cereals, a different kind of uh, nuts and so on. This is a, India is the largest producer of all these products. And India is the second largest producer of following agricultural products, for example, wheat, rice, vegetables, sugarcane, uh, all the crash crops and so on. So when you look at these statistics of how much we produce uh, for, for as a food, so uh, it is evident that India has enough of uh, what it needs, what it demands. So what people, how the world sees is, the, the, the country, country has 1.3 billion people. That means 1.3 billion mouths and human souls. So whatever we're producing is self-sufficient for all of us. If you see India's imports, India majorly imports the petroleum products, gold, silver, precious stones, electronics, and machinery, large machinery, heavy machinery in major portion. And it does, in generally, it does not import food to the country. So it implies that we are more or less self-sufficient in most of the aspects, except the uh, high energy and, uh, and the metals, precious metals and stones. So, so in that sense, the India is a not poor country. It has all the resources, what the 1.3 billion people needs except the highly demanded energy products and the stones, which is not a necessity. So if you see across uh, India, we see certain kind of uh, uh, elements, uh, for example, low standard of education, in inadequate educated workforce. We don't find innovation across the country, uh, very less compared to the population we have. Uh, low standard of living, unemployment, and uh, low pay jobs. We see poverty. We see loss in um, public sector industries. We have numerous public sector industries that run in losses. Uh, and uh, that's how the state of uh, public sector industries are. And we see inflation and we see policy instability with the changing in governments. Each government is uh, diametrically opposite to uh, policies of the earlier governments. So we see that policy instability. We also witness poor infrastructure in planning and execution and, uh, and, 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 and general the quality of infrastructure. And we also see a kind of a social distrust. That means nobody's trusting of each other. That's the kind of India we have created that uh, there is always some kind of uh, uh, distrust exists in all kinds of relationships. So that is a common phenomena and we generally see a general backwardness. So why the India the way it is today, the media, the local media or national media or international uh, reports speak of these are the reasons why India is backward. For example, it talks about social inequality leading to exclusion and marginalization of people. And the caste system in Indian society is the biggest cause of all these problems we just mentioned earlier. Second problem, uh, this is a, these all uh, uh, things, uh, the things are being repeatedly being said from last 70 years, the narrative of the international press and national press hasn't changed. So what was 70 years, 80 years ago when the India got freedom and what we are see today in the newspapers is almost same. The conditions for India, why it's not progressing. So literacy is another one. That means just inability to read and comprehend some symbols of, of a particular language. The person is perfectly able to speak their own mother tongue, perfectly comprehend the cultural, um, understanding, uh, but uh, the system, the, the government system, and in general, the work, uh, the, the, uh, the, the workforce uh, institutions, they, call, they label them as illiterates. 
And the second, third problem the, the, the media reports say is the, the India is not progressing because of it's a huge population. So population is the biggest problem. And it also talks about the evil in the Hindu society, which is gender inequality. Uh, and they talk about sex ratios, how in one state it is like uh, uh, the thousand to thousand boys, there is 900 or 800 girls. So this is a big problem. So that's why India is backward. And uh, it also talks about unequal distribution of wealth that very few people has richest, uh, 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 rich, and uh, most of the people are in uh, middle class or lower middle class group. So there is a huge inequality of distribution. And uh, it also talks about faulty economic systems. Uh, when we were in 90s or 80s, when, we were, when, when Indians used to stand in a queue to get uh, telephone lines or scooters or, uh, or getting even milk and bread, uh, the socialism of the time has been highly praised. And now uh, the, still there are political parties who ask for the same socialism uh, and the state controlled uh, uh, systems to be implied. And they always bickering about there is always a fault in the economic system. And uh, the, the, another major portion is, uh, it says that India is not developing is because of corruption. There is a corruption at every level from, uh, from, from a local uh, office to the highest offices and the judges and courts in the world. So corruption is a huge problem why India is, is not developing. And, uh, and there is a, also notion that there is a cultural, uh, the colonial uh, systems and baggage that still people continue and leading that. So these are the, some of the uh, factors they say why India is a state which uh, it is in. So in the rest of the presentation, we'll try to uh, analyze all these propositions we just uh, saw. Uh, how true are they? Are these media houses, national and international uh, paper, newspaper bodies, are they speaking truth? Or are they trying to deviate uh, or, or, um, or, or misguide the population? So that will be the main uh, uh, the agenda. So let us see the source of the problem in two categories. One is in terms of a global trends, what happened in the last 70, 100 years, and uh, what are the actual Indian problems we face day to day in day to day. First thing is we'll take the global trends. Global trends is there is an unexpected surprise uh, which uh, the India found out that um, the richest Western nations uh, of the world formed a group called OCED, which is called Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. They, they made it around 1961. The whole uh, idea of that organization is to keep the wealth in Western countries. It does not want to share the global GDP share to any other countries. How to safeguard that? That's the main goal of that organization so that the Western countries always remains as richest. So uh, from, 19, uh, from, uh, from uh, 1990s and 2000, early 2000s, the Western countries have realized the, there is a shift in the economic demands and the countries like China, India, Brazil, and some other African countries, they are increasing their GDP share. So they did not like that, something is happening. So to find out, they funded this uh, economist, a well-renowned economist called Angus Medicine to study, to, the, uh, to study, the, study and quantify the long-term changes in economic world economy from first century AD till 2000s, how the economies in the world changed. So that, that study was never done. So they asked him to do it. So he did, and he published a report in the, in, in, in the name called the World Economy in two volumes. One is called the Millennium Perspective and second is called Historic Studies. And that is surprising to the most of the world because uh, there were no study like that. People used to say just by memory from their oral traditions 
but there were never a so-called scientific study, economic study being done. So what it found is astonishing, which says that when they see from the first century AD till 2000, these are the trends they see. They took the share of world GDP share of United States, China, Europe, and India. And from the first millennium, uh, from the uh, first 80, uh, first C, beginning of this 2000 years, uh, English, uh, India and China were the dominant factors in, in, in the global trade and global economy till 15th century. Uh, you can, we know from the over uh, literary sources and the evidences that during 12th century, India has faced uh, a waves of serious invasions from the, from the, from the Islamic, uh, 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 Islamic tribes from the West. So that has uh, led us to decline in the economy slowly, but it wasn't drastic. So it was still continuing the trend and out of uh, around 1750s and, uh, and early uh, 18th century, um, 18th century, the, we can see a drastic fall in uh, the economy, Indian economy. And this is where the actual loot of India started by British. So by uh, when the British left India, the India's global percentage in the world GDP was almost 1.222%. So well below 1.5%. Uh, so you can see from 35% or uh, from the beginning of 17th century, which was approximately 25% of global GDP, the India's GDP was 1.2%. So that much the loot has happened in India. And during the time, uh, China's economy has also collapsed due to the other reasons around the 1800s due to the, the, the imperial um, uh, instability and so on. So around uh, 1970s uh, and 80s, China started uh, this manufacturing um, the trend and it started picking up its uh, the global GDP in economy. India has uh, started slowly in, in 1990s with the liberation of its economy and uh, the, the progress is still going on. And uh, this, is, this is unprecedented because the world has never imagined that India, the Asia, which is uh, India and China were the richest countries in the world for, for almost 300 years back. So they were, uh, the skeptics were there, what's happening? So, uh, so uh, from the Indian perspective, we know why this fall happened during this time. One is raise of social evils in terms of uh, due to the long-term foreign subjugation. The universities in India were destroyed, the cultural centers were destroyed and uh, there was no national, uh, the, there was no uh, the cohesion in the society. So that has led to the uh, loss in trade, uh, loss in skills in, um, there is no big projects coming up, for example, making of temples or dams or rivers, which used to be a common theme before for the public welfare. So with that, the economy has collapsed. And second thing we see is the replacement of a traditional Indian education system, by a Macaulay or Western education system, which was introduced around 1780s. And uh, another effect of that downfall in economy is due to the effect of European colonizations, the, the, the loot which happened. So that is the, uh, all three reasons. So we will look into the, the, the European, how the European colonization affected the Indian economy and, uh, and uh, uh, we'll see into that. So what happened is when the Islamic trade, uh, Islamic uh, uh, the tribes, when they came to India and uh, they took over politically, they were doing a lot of uh, physical damage to country, but it wasn't a mental damage. It wasn't a change in lifestyle. They were doing everything physical. They were breaking temples, they were breaking, uh, killing people, uh, burning libraries and universities. It was all physical, but mentally, whoever were isolated from that, um, uh, from that uh, violence, 
they were still continuing their own uh, lifestyle, organic lifestyle from the beginning. But the foreign rule, what has changed it, the, the, the colonized Europe to raise their markets and wealth, they came to India, that is uh, known. Once they uh, got the political power uh, in uh, 1850s, after 1850s, they started building roads, they're building rail, they started building storage houses, they started building transport, and they started uh, establishing cities. And this has led to, uh, and they built all this for to constant supply of, um, to continue constant export of goods. Uh, initially, they started from Burma and Rangoon and, and Calcutta, then it moved to Mumbai and uh, Chennai and other parts uh, slowly added up. So uh, around 1980s, the towns like Mumbai and Calcutta came up with the standard and the, and the flair, the, how the European cities used to look like. And that has led to the first kind of uh, migration, human migration happened to the urban areas from the villages. So Indian uh, general economy uh, from prehistoric times used to be believed in a village economy. So in that village economy, it was self-sufficient unit where people used to live with the, with the nature and they used to produce what they want and they used to consume and that's how the system was uh, established. So, uh, so in this model, the man was part of the nature and uh, he never uh, rode that, uh, crossed the limit. But the, with, the, with the establishment of urban cities, with the, the human migration happened, men used to come to work and their families used to stay back, which is still a constant, uh, even today, that is true, that is happening. So this urbanization has led to breakdown of the intimate relationship between the man and the nature. So this has, and that led to the breakdown of the weakening the cultural legacy of the land. So the, the festival seasons, economy, and the trades which used to flourish in villages were came down. So this has uh, disrupted the economy of the, uh, of the land. So in the village system, in the village economy, the consumer and, pr and producer used to live next to each other. They were neighbors and one is used to produce and one used to consume. But the, the urbanized Western model or a Western economic model when it came, it clearly separated who is the producer and who is the consumer. And in, in general in food, we can clearly see the consumer is the biggest, uh, is a lord because he has he lives in a city and he has money power and the, for example farmer who lives in a village uh, and he's rooted with the soil he became a kind of a slave to to uh, to fulfill the demands of the urban population so this has naturally broken the large portion of the urbanized people with the land and 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 that had created a huge problem so the engine of this Western model of habitation disrupted the natural flow in Indian subcontinent. So on economic model, we see that the problem is not of economic reforms, but the type of economic system itself, because it, it is completely opposite to the native beliefs, native way of living and, uh, and uh, a native idea what economy is. So this, um, alien model trying to fit into the India has created this problem. So the, the discussion about what is good for, uh, what kind of economic model is good for India, socialism, capitalism, Gaurishankar, are you there? So we'll just wait for his reconnection. Hello, I, I, I'm sorry, I think I lost it for him. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah.
All right, so I hope you heard this slide. So, um, so the main point in this slide is that uh, for our economy, we, uh, we must uh, invent a new economic model in future that should respect Indian priorities in our lifestyle, and it should harbor Indian point of view. The, the, the foreign systems such as socialism, capitalism, or democratic capitalism will not fit India, and it will not help uh, India to reach its uh, full potential. So from 18th century, what we've seen across the, across the globe in the global trends is mass industrialization with the advent of science, with the, with the invention of new tools and, uh, and steam engine and so on. And this has led to disappearance of distances, the distant continents uh, through, through steamboats and, uh, and the rails become accessible. And uh, that, uh, I mean, uh, with, the, with the navigation, with the, with the uh, discovery of navigation, uh, when it reached European people, it, uh, I mean, at the time around uh, 14th century, 15th century, Europe was in desperate condition because a few hundred years back, it has uh, suffered something called Black Plague. plague. The whole of Europe was uh, under a, a plague and it has decimated its population approximately to 25%. So uh, in that desperate condition and with the, with the new diseases like potato famine, which happened in Ireland and so, they were in desperate condition to find new lands and a new economy. And the, their oral traditions in Europe used to say the East, East was always rich, the India was always rich, and they have no means to go there. And slowly the expedition started, some went to Europe, some went to, uh, sorry, some went to America, some went to Caribbeans, some went to South America, and few fellows came to Cochin that we know, um, uh, Vasco de Gama fellow, Portuguese fellow. Who, who took support of uh, Indian merchants who were trading in Mozambique in uh, Africa, in Eastern Africa. And by, with their help, he came to India. He didn't actually discover India, he just took help of the Indian traders, which were already trading in Africa. And he came to uh, India. That was also documented and uh, well hidden from the natural uh, general uh, uh, discourse. So, uh, so what we see is that this uh, um, the the easy continental travel turned that technology of easy uh, continental travel has turned a good neighbor into a troublesome rogue. So Europe was good when it was in, in not touch with the rest of the native population, but once they came, they brought with them their own culture and they started imposing their political nature of how to govern the societies. And that has led to serious ethnic cleansing of native cultures in the name of civilizing them, in the name of uh, white man's burden to convert them to Christianity and, it, and uh, seriously depleting the natural resources of that place. So that was uh, the trend we see in the global trends. So what, what are the driving ideologies behind all these actions of, of the, uh, of the, in the world? Uh, the West is, uh, I mean, across the world in the last 300 years, if you see, there is a unethical exploitation of nature happen. And that happened because of beliefs and validation with something called utilitarian philosophy. Utilitarian philosophy, uh, says that it is the greatest uh, it is the greatest happiness of the greatest number that is measure of right or wrong so there is no morally right or wrong but if uh, in a group of 100 people uh, maximum number says this is what we want that becomes a true so uh, that has that basic idea has led to this uh, era of anthropocene in geological history that means the human activity changed the planet uh, and uh, destroying everything for the, just for human convenience. So it changes the, uh, the patterns, uh, it changing the destroying the ecosystems and so on. 
So what are these uh, utilitarian philosophy and what are these beliefs? Utilitarian philosophy, uh, philo I mean, beliefs is just think that the intrinsically good is the pleasure. So for that pleasure, you and uh, and another thing is intrinsically bad is pain. So you should uh, always have pain and uh, and uh, stay away from the. Uh, I mean, always have pleasure and stay away from the pain. Pain, uh, pain, and it always uh, advocates like. Uh, um, Happiness and the avoidance of unhappiness are the only things that are intrinsically good. So, and uh, and hap how you get happiness by fulfilling your desires or wants. So, with this want, which is the core philosophy of a economy, uh, which is, uh, I mean, the economists say the father of economics is Adam Smith, who wrote Wealth of Nations book called Wealth of Nations, in that he postulated. The economy basic fundamental, uh, the way the economy work is, uh, the fundamental law is the desire of a person. So that desire has created various inv uh, inventions, for example, uh, the, the mechanized uh, tools, steam powered engines, electrification, motorization of transport. And uh, I mean, in recent times we have, uh, last 50 years we have seen computers, now we are seeing internet technology and social media and so on. And that has led to the various uh, economic problem, I mean, environmental problems. When the water powered mechanization started uh, and, and the steam coal started, uh, there is a serious problem of uh, smog and due to the urbanization slums were started in Europe. And that has led to the forest depletion for the wood and the timber and so on. And similarly, with the electrification and transport, the water pollution and soil pollution become a huge problem. Then with the motorization of the transport and, uh, and, uh, and all other facilities, the, for example, smog, acid rain, climate change, uh, and uh, the radioactive waste from the uh, nuclear power plants become a, another huge issue. And the invention of atom bombs and the, and the um, uh, unethical testing everywhere in the world has created huge uh, radiation and so on issues like that. And today we have the internet and computers and social media, which is actually driving a silent uh, psychological problems in, uh, in, in, the, in the human population across the world, which is leading to seriously uh, uh, affecting the mental health of the people. So, these are the kind of uh, the, the, the inventions people did and how it affected the society back uh, is clearly evident in that slide. And what is driving this uh, engine of economy and commerce? It always depends on the markets. That means there is a, there always has to be demand. And when there is no demand, the market, the marketing uh, and the marketing houses and the market uh, and the advertising uh, businesses, houses, they know how to create an interest in the society by using the psychological tricks. And that, uh, and, and the proving and uh, making convincing people that is, will bring you pleasure. So that constant need and demand for the goods is uh, being created. On this issue of utilitarianism, Bapuji has said, Mahatma Gandhi, he commented that utilitarianism means it is a nakedness that in order to achieve supposed good of 51%, the interest of 49% may be or rather should be sacrificed. It is a heartless doctrine and, and has done harm to humanity. So he was vehemently opposing uh, the, 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 the ideology of the utilitarianism in conducting economy, business, uh, politics, and sci science, everything uh, together. So utilitarianism has its uh, impressions in various spheres of activity, for example, uh, damage to oceans. Uh, the unsustainable fishing, fishing across the world has led to the 53% of world fisheries are fully exploited and the 32% are overexploited and depleted uh, beyond the recovery. It is estimated that by 1950s, most of the world uh, wild population of fish 
will be hard to recover. And each year, billions of unwanted fish and other animals, for example, uh, dolphins, uh, turtles, seabirds, sharks, corals die due to the illegal practices in fishing industry. The second problem uh, is the utilitarianism. What is causing is the demand for going for tourism. The, generally, tourism is in coastal habitats and the coastal regions we know from the, from the Maldive Islands to Indonesia or Bali or, uh, or Caribbean islands and the cruises, huge cruise ships which go around. So what it, uh, what it did is uh, it has uh, created a huge demand to live in the coastal areas. Uh, it is estimated that approximately 60% of world population live along the coast areas from the 60 kilometers from the coastal areas. And uh, this mass tourism across the world often destroyed local cultures. And it, has, it hasn't actually helped the local economy or, or to increase the income of the local people, but it actually suppressed it. And on top of it, it has destroyed the environment. So that is a kind of uh, effects we see. And we all generally see due to the, uh, the, the trading uh, of goods through the shipping, we see oil spills and we see uh, the, for the gas extraction program, <clears throat> programs, we see uh, building uh, offshore platforms and, and pipelines and uh, fertil use of fertilizers to, uh, to for, the, for the growth of agricultural crops has created huge dead zones. That means nothing grows and no fish you can find in the parts of world such as Gulf of Mexico, Baltic Sea and other areas. In addition to that, uh, we, I mean, just throwing away of garbage has created huge patches of uh, garbage and the swill around the huge oceans. Uh, pr pr uh, sizes of continents, that much gar garbage has been, uh, has been thrown. And, uh, and in addition to the toxic chemicals, the damage to environment is also can be seen by, uh, by seeing the exhaust gases by the traffic, by deforestation, uh, high number of industries such as mining, uh, chemical effluents and the transport, unprecedented con concrete construction across the world, or even, uh, for example, in Northern America and Australia, you can see the houses are built with wood. So that uh, even asking for wood for so many people has created decimated forests in Indonesia and, uh, and in Brazil. And uh, human population exploitation for the jobs and stuff and unplanned land policies. It has also uh, damaged this utilitarian principle or beliefs have seriously affected the wildlife. It is estimated that out of 100 million different species which has coexisted with us, approximately 100,000 species are, are becoming extinct every year. And uh, what we did to the uh, wildlife or the natural world is we picked, logged, plucked, and hunted uh, animals, trees, flowers, and fishes for or need and uh, want of medicines, souvenirs, status symbols, building material, and food. So, uh, and also we have changed the way the natural habitats uh, exist. For example, from last, uh, I mean, in, in 2000, in last decade, uh, from 2000 to 2010, approximately 13 million hectares of forest was cut across the world, which is size of almost the peninsula of India. Okay, so that much forest cover is lost in just 10 years. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, you can imagine the loss of uh, habitats loss of animals, loss of a uh, whole of uh, collapse of the ecosystems and biodiversity in the, in the across the world. <clears throat> it is estimated that approximately two thirds of the world population by 2025 can, can face serious water issues and it could be a couple. And, uh, we, and, uh, and in general, there is a decrease in uh, quality of life across the world that the utopia that a urbanized city is better than living in a village has uh, no basis to stand on because in urbanized cities we see growth of slums 
not just in India, it is, it is, it is uh, true everywhere in the world, from Indonesia to Mexico to, to uh, South America. Uh, uh, and uh, and in, uh, in cities, uh, people come for a job in search of cities. They, uh, they have low wages uh, because, because of low wages, only single person comes to work in a city and the family stays back and has led to the uh, breakdown of families and uh, creating nuclear families. And uh, in, in cities, generally you see poor sanitation and serious health issues. So it has affected the human uh, population across the world, hoping that it will uh, reap benefits, but it's actually harmed it. So how did humans did it? So they did it with the help of science, which has power to create tools. Uh, generally, create is to supposed to help uh, store uh, knowledge uh, for a curious, curious man. And, um, but what it happened is the science uses a method called scientific method. And it generally, though it helped in progressing the human civilization, it has its own uh, drawbacks. For example, for the well being of uh, humans, there is a practice called vivisection. That means we test all the um, procedures, medical procedures, and, uh, and medicines, whatever discovered on animals first. And the amount of animals die is unprecedented. And the torture and the, and the in, I mean, uh, the, the, the degradation level of treatment of those animals is unimaginable, what we, see, what we can see. So uh, and, uh, the scientific method, always happy to introduce a new material. I think we lost the connection. We'll just uh, give him a moment to rejoin. Thanks. Uh, all right, uh, I hope you can see this now. So in addition to that, what humans did is the involvement of production of atom bombs, which has created a irreversible change and changed the politics and the way humans treat with the nature. So general why it all happened is the scientists, why it always happened is the scientists say it is not a defect in science or scientists, but the politicians, policymakers, and industrialists demand for the products and we create it and we give it to them. So they wash their hands. So science becomes, uh, uh, they say science always adapts to the political, economic, and social circumstances and it delivers the knowledge and technology. So generally what, uh, what we see in the scientific establishment is and scientific methodologies, it is, it's very myopic in its action because it's, it has inability to self-criticize what science is doing and how it's adapting and it's causing uh, global problems. It, the science and scientists cannot see. And it's also unidirectional because of its uh, narrow anthropological profiting point of view. If you give a few million dollars to a scientist to create something, he will work day and night to create something without uh, accessing what will it happen to the world. And the same thing uh, true for the creation of atom bomb. So we need to think, re um, think uh, need, there is a need to rethink the approach to science and how we conduct uh, science. In addition to that, the facade of economy that uh, by saying that consumerism is good for economy, it is a common term used everywhere in economics. Consumerism, consumerism means good state of economy and, uh, and the governments and the, and the policymakers uh, encourage uh, people to consume more because there is a belief that good standard of living depends on highly, uh, on highly economic success and material, material position. And um, the Western model of economy uh, can only be the uh, benchmark to call other economies as a developed or not developed. 
And uh, with that, the traditional lifestyles and the ancient cultures must be forgotten for quicker economic development. So for that reason, you see the traditional way of dressing and traditional way of habits, people tending to forget faster because it is considered as backward and it will not lead them for a material uh, well-being. And the shift in the aim of education, uh, uh, the aim of education has become to gain knowledge so that you can get a good job to earn money, which will help you and, and, and satisfy you as a successful and having a secure life. So the whole purpose of education has changed just for economic gain. And uh, in, 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 uh, in the social cultural damage, what it did is separation and alienation of native wisdom, language, and culture in the name of civilizing it and modernizing it. And that is a trend across the world. So what we see is utilitarianism is a social political ideology which runs in the society and which is supported by the, uh, the scientific method, by scientific ideology, which creates tools for the desires, what we want. And the desire is a, uh, which goes to the uh, economy, which is a socio-economic ideology. And the, and the economy again creates demand or the want in a people and, and, the, and the scientists create something and it, this circle goes on. This perpetual mission of a global, uh, modern global civilization has led to serious problems everywhere. That has led to the anthropocentric morality and that is creating wars, conflict, and the destruction of uh, environment everywhere. So uh, the features of this uh, modern global culture is a more human-centric morality, control of natural elements as far as possible, fear of death. That means uh, let us use tools of science to figure it out so that we can mitigate death whatever, uh, in whatever way it can happen. And considering um, consider stock as primitive and bad against development. That means if you don't, uh, the, if streets are not lit, that means it's a primitive society and so on. And there is no sympathy uh, to other living beings, for example, other animals around us. And sometimes we use them for our pleasure because, uh, for example, having a pets in a, in a room and that we leave for a whole day. People leave it for a whole day. So that kind of happen, things are happening. And generally what happens is the cultural heritage of a, any place uh, uh, is as aligned with the religion. So in the terms of, uh, and, and try, people try to negate uh, cultural heritage and the people start to talk of uh, secularism, liberalism, economy, modernization and industrialization. So these are the, uh, modern and uh, sophisticated words that should uh, be followed and then cultural heritage should be forgotten. And, uh, and also there is a change in the way the social systems work uh, from 1920s. There is uh, a, a kind of um, propaganda runs across the world saying that sexual urge is a natural and a noble thing. And from 1920s, there is a mass media uh, 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 propaganda for the birth control companies. The companies started controlling the mass media and just to increase the sales of uh, these products. And it also said, uh, I mean, in the movies, you see love is always portrayed as a uh, physical attractiveness. Uh, the, the subtleties of uh, human uh, emotions are being washed off and uh, just a physical attractiveness and those things uh, run a play. And, uh, and, and uh, the commercial products for the cosmetics and stuffs, they always portray beauty as only of a physical reality. That's the only thing that exists. And, uh, and, uh, and slowly the morality of that, the sexual urge has been isolated from the desire of progeny or having, giving birth to the children so that uh, the motherhoodness uh, and the fatherhoodness and the sexual urge are completely barred and it has created a huge uh, 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 mental issues, uh, uh, health issues across the world. And the conception is uh, considered as an accident 
to be prevented, uh, except when the parties desire to have children. So this has created, this is funded by the huge industry of itself uh, from, from the um, print, from print industry, from the movie industry to the, uh, to the medical, uh, this uh, contraceptive um, uh, uh, companies and so on. They run the propaganda is still going on. This is a small uh, 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 observation uh, Rabindranath uh, Thakur did in, uh, in the 1920s. He, uh, I mean, it's a long paragraph. I would, uh, I will just, uh, I will share that in the group so that you, will, you can read it later. So what he, uh, what he trying to say is uh, in this, he's saying the, the humans, uh, we want to enjoy privileges which none else, none else can share with us. And that has led to the state of uh, civil war among people. And uh, though the whole universe, the universal spirit is waiting to crown us with happiness, but our individual spirit would not accept it. It is, it upsets the normal balance of the society and give rise to miseries of all kind. It brings things to the such a pass that to maintain order, we have to create artificial coisons and organize form a trinity and to and tolerate inferior institutions in our midst, whereby every moment humanity is humiliated. So the the so the institutions what we have in terms of companies, in terms of uh, uh, industries, in terms of governments, in terms of uh, other uh, forms of institutions, they continuously dehumanize human humanity and disrespect humanity. And that has become a common noun now. So this is the observation he made. So if you see the roots of Indian civilization, what caused the Indian crisis from Indian point of view, we see that uh, uh, from last 50, one, 150 years, the, the strategy of propaganda by European nations has changed, interestingly, in context of India. For example, it has been uh, feeding to generations of Indian, Africans, all the native cultures that culture and religion are almost same. So that has created a huge identity crisis in India. For example, uh, uh, we have seen this earlier uh, that historically religion is a product of a culture, but uh, Western scholars started using and preaching to the world that culture and religion are same. And in 19th century, European historians started saying the culture is a unique product of a particular religion. And that has created an identity crisis. Therefore, the, the Bharatiyas or Indias who follow a different religion started associating themselves with a different place rather than their own ancestral culture. For example, people who follow Islam tend to recognize with the Middle East and the people who converted and, and following Christianity tend to uh, see uh, closeness with the Europeans and white people rather than following the Indian culture because, because of this definition, culture is unique to the religion. People started seeing that Indian culture is unique to Hinduism. Therefore, they need not to follow and that has created to the partition of the country and so on. So there is a misplaced idea in the sociology due to the Western uh, ideology creeped into the intrusion of Western ideology into the Indian society. And that has created huge conflicts. For example, the, the creation of a false notion of a Varna system as a caste system and divided the society in terms of socio-culturally and socio-religiously and bringing up a theory, a false notion theory without any basis called the India is made up of different uh, ethnicities. Uh, for example, there is Aryans, Davidians, Dalits, and so on, and the Adivasis. And so they were different people. So India was never a one, one country, and uh, it's not a, of one people. So it just to uh, uh, um, prove their supremacy and the easy uh, uh, division, so they have created such systems. For example, Varna system is a tech, uh, from Indian point of view, it's a economic, social economic system, but we, uh, and our, uh, our text says that all these four Varnas are 
equal without uh, hierarchy, but Western uh, missionaries and Western uh, sociologists turned into a hierarchical system and they popularized it. And that led to the fall in economy because the social uh, ties are broken down and that has led to the fall in economy in villages and, uh, and constant rights here and there, discord and distrust has led to the uh, fail in economy. Uh, in education too, we have saw, see the shift in um, uh, what we consider to be educated and, uh, and uh, the aim of education is. For example, the majority of masses identify that the aim of education is to earn money and to live luxurious life as a successful and achievement of life. So uh, this, uh, so all these problems were there, uh, uh, issues are there. So what it had impact on the Indian education system is that the masses of new generation of people, for example, from 1970s, they saw and they solidified in the minds that the material philosophy of the life is the true one and they allude to the material comforts and so on. And they started uh, asking for them. So which means one is really happy and successful if uh, satisfies bodily desires and, this, and save sufficient enough for the uh, individual consumption, which is not uh, false, but it has taken to different levels. So, uh, so was India an utop uh, utopia in the past too? No, we had our own problems in the past. For example, uh, that, for example, uh, before 18th century, India never had a transfer of resources in the in the times of calamity. For example, a, a, a huge cyclone hits the coast of uh, Bengal and Odisha. Even though there are resources in the Maharashtra, we cannot transport them because there were no facility like that. There is a no storage facilities for food for all in case of any problem. And there was a difficulty in mobility around the country. People used to walk uh, long distances and so on. The problem comes is when there is the blind copying of morals and the institutions from West to India. So which has led to the serious problem. And, uh, and just by aping West, we will not, uh, it will not help us. So the flaws lies in the Western education system that uh, the, the defect lies in the application of foreign system blindly as it is or without modification to the indigenous society like India. So all these issues uh, have their roots and source in continuing the Western education system to Indian minds. So we can see that the, in Indian uh, traditional uh, education system, it was based on uh, the value-based system. It has shifted from value-based system to skill-based system. So the goal of education is slowly changed to the perfection in some trade rather than emancipating and man from its ignorance which was the common theme in ancient scriptures of India, that the educated man is free from the ignorance. But that has changed uh, to uh, tr perfection in some trade. And, and that has led uh, creating large number of hands who can follow instructions and look for food to eat, but, but do not recognize that the masters of their own hand. So that has led to the loss of confidence and uh, creating uh, 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 the innovations. It's almost seven. I will just continue for five more minutes and finish it off. Uh, this, uh, this Western education system and application in the Indian subcontinent has created the actual problem of unemployment because the unemployment problem is the person who cannot find it find a suitable job for the things what he has learned. So for example, someone learned carpentry and he can find a job in some, uh, in some, uh, some place or say I'm an engineer and I could not find a civil engineering job. That means I'm un unemployed. But the purpose of education is supposed to be he should able to apply his knowledge in whatever the things or to innovate at least innovate and create uh, self-employment for himself. So that has hampered the youth in creating their own employment. 
uh, and the gift of such blind uh, copying and follow of British rules and British, uh, British policies in India has created uh, the Hindu Muslim divide. And it has created in the Western, in the, in the education system, it fueled the separatist mentality, uh, the section mentality, the, uh, the hankering for the material living and developed a hostility and unfriendliness with nature. Which, which if you see the works of, uh, for example, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, he wrote in 1910, a book called Hind Swaraj. Okay, so in that Hind Swaraj, he mentioned uh, the, the path that India should follow for its own growth. And it is highly indigenous and uh, apt to the Indian conditions, but we chose to follow the other. If you see the even today current political narratives, we see, or in Indian textbooks, we see neglect of uh, negli uh, negligence and insult of Gandhi compared to the popularity of Marx, Karl Marx, because because of same Eurocentric mentality that uh, the ethnocentric basis, which says that European was a, was a European, Marx was a European, therefore he was more supremacist. And Gandhi was from an Eastern tradition, so you should be looked down upon. That same trend, same uh, notion is still continuing in today's education system. And Marx was a scholar in European standards. He wrote with facility and literally style, where Gandhi's writings were simple and straightforward. Marx belonging to the, belongs to the Enlightenment tradition in, in West, but Gandhi does not. So, so the general across the world, and even in India, they ignore Gandhi and his principles and his ideas. And uh, Marx rejected religion, especially Christianity. And he brought his own style of uh, religion, which is a Marxism, uh, suggested that uh, the future will be belong to the radical secular humanist. So Mark, uh, Karl Marx used to say, the religion is the opium, opiate of masses, but Gandhiji said, truth is God. So he related the, the, the truth to the God, which is with the religion. So, and uh, Mark was, uh, Karl Marx was, was a prophet of a violent conflict, that is the overthrowing of a state, always uh, suggested, but uh, Gandhiji was uh, other way around. He preferred non-violence and respectable uh, mutual co-living. So there was a serious clash between the Western idea and the Indian indigenous idea. And uh, it has led to the, uh, the wrong definition of development. Uh, for example, in Hind Swaraj, he talked about political and economic independence and evolutionary form of indigenous institutions and cultural values. And he said, we not to depend on West to create what is good for us. But uh, that didn't happen. Uh, by one of the definitions from, from a organization from Canada, it said that it defined, try to define what is a developed society and what is underdeveloped society. A developed society means where people uh, need, get whatever they need, for example, land, food, shelter, education, and so on. And they all are satisfied, whatever the needs are. Underdeveloped means the growth of, uh, uh, process of growth where the benefits are acquired to the minority and the needs of majority are not met. So actually the village system, what we had earlier was a developed society and what we have created today is a underdeveloped society. So that has shifted from the indigenous thought to the, uh, to the, uh, the Western thought. So that led to the underdevelopment of most of the native societies. So that has led to the land of contradictions in India. For example, the British ploy to bifurcate the subcontinent in terms of religion as Hindus and Muslims, and in terms of caste as a Suvarna and uh, Harijans and so on, by state of, uh, by, 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 by using the division of uh, dominion states and uh, by creating a sociological theory called race and introducing concept of race in India and dividing the people into Aryans and Dravidians. And this uh, strategy of British had brought excellent results. And uh, by the end of uh, independence, by the beginning of independence, the, uh, the India, sub Indian subcontinent is divided, is uh, partitioned into 
two or three different countries. So post-independence, uh, we can see that uh, there is a, um, there is a uh, uh, affinity towards Marxist and Leninist rather than path of Gandhi, and uh, which resulted in the creating India in the, as a land of contradictions. We see rural and urban population, poor and rich, hinterlands and metropolis are completely opposite to each other. And we see that most of the agricultural areas except uh, Punjab, it is more underdeveloped and productive uh, than 70 years ago. So generally what, uh, what happening, what India is facing or Indian civilization is facing is that the world forces strategically destroying and extinguishing nature cultures from its soil. That's its whole motto. And, uh, and the remaining, remaining native cultures are dented and deformed with uh, urbanization, material ideologies, and the narrow trap of uh, scientific justification. So India at present is at crossroads and we have two ways. One is to, one as a race to develop as a developed nation by the current accepted terms. That means by, by, by accepting Western notions of what is to be developed. And that, leave, that will lead to destroy, uh, destruction of its ancient shoal. Uh, so India will lose its uh, culture, its, uh, its languages and its soul, and it will give rise to material wealth. But along with that, it will create hatred and division more and more. And other way is to create a new civilized consciousness, which depends on the, the ancient Indian philosophies and uh, reliving those philosophies. <coughs> and uh, uh, the, <clears throat> what, what decides these two, which path the India will go is uh, related to the politics. And uh, if you see political parties across India and their manifestos, you can see they weren't Indian friendly or they are working for people. So what we need to do is we have to create a unity uh, cultural consciousness across the India. And uh, though the foreign forces and their paid internal forces based on social customs, caste, religion, skin color, language, economic division, try to separate and disown the cultural unity of this land, but somehow we have to uh, protect ourselves. If not, uh, we will fall, the civiliz Indian civilization will fall, and the sinister egos of those uh, enemies and malicious motives of those people will prefer, and it will be laughing at the cops of many. So that has to be prevented. And uh, so therefore, why India is backward, the postulates we saw initially uh, by the Western media and uh, national media, what they portray, why India is underdeveloped. But uh, if you see the analysis of all, we see the actual reason of degradation of India is because of shift in org organic uh, life and, uh, and accepting a Western model of uh, habitation, believing in the principle of utilitarianism, action of science and technology without humanity, improper application of uh, scientific methods, uh, unsuitable economic ideas which were imposed or self-imposed on uh, Indian people or Indian economy or Indian life, uh, unfriendly education system which makes people hostile and enemies to own kind. So that kind of education system we are running. And uh, similarly, socio-cultural damage which created by the political parties, loss of identity in terms of various divisions we just mentioned, divisive politics, which is always backed by the Western interest. And uh, general belief that everything comes from the West is good and everything indigenous and cultural belongs, what we have belongs to dark age. So it should be forgotten. So these are the actual problems uh, as for my uh, analysis I found, uh, which causing the degradation of the India. So, uh, the so only solution what we have is to revive the dharmic knowledge, what we have and uh, get rooted in the civilization values. If we get rooted in civilization values, we will revive socially. I mean, we will revive the social consciousness. We will uh, economically prosper. 
we will be will become a innovative society because uh, we won't we won't be under the trap of current education system and uh, with that the cultural uh, heritage of india is scientific in a sense therefore it will increase the scientific temperament and overall it will raise the standard of living across the indian subcontinent so with that i end thank you very much questions are welcomed thank you once again uh, gauri shankar for the for a wonderful uh, um, informational and uh, perhaps educational session. Education in the sense it's uh, a perspective where uh, not many voices are heard. Um, sorry, I'm unable to switch on my video. Uh, please okay? don't mind. All right, then that's, that's okay. Go ahead. I'll invite questions now. So let's uh, let's have some questions if uh, if we can. Uh, it will be nice to hear views from people because particularly a topic where uh, Western uh, value system and uh, Eastern value system comes to be discussed and uh, uh, compared. It's not about uh, which one uh, is better than the other. Yeah. Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm sure me and Gauri Shekha would like to believe that uh, the Indian value system is far superior. Uh, but uh, that wouldn't mean that others should have a different viewpoint. True. Um, but this is also coming, our, our point of view comes from the fact that we are holistic in uh, outlook. Yes. And um, there is a natural sustenance of everyone in this uh, planet, particularly, uh, unlike the Western uh, model, yes. which has uh, looked at humans growth at the expense of everybody else yes and even among unfortunately even among the humans they have categorized as believers and non-believers and the non-believers are either uh, exterminated or uh, they are uh, forced to follow their own path uh, their yes. path so uh, these have been really challenging um, so let's have uh, some questions if we can Okay, seems like we sir, have. Uh, sir, hmm? a small question, sir. Yes, Rajgar. Yeah. Uh, when when was this casteism started, sir? After Britishers or uh, when the Mughals were entered into India? When exactly it took place, sir? Earlier, only Varnasrama was there, but no caste were there. I I, I understand. Okay, I'm not too sure if Gauri Shankar lost his connection. He may have. Be because this point is clear for us, we can uh, at least educate some people, sir. Yeah, let's wait for Gauri Shankar to join. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I think. Yeah. Um, please repeat your question. Yes, sir. Sir, when did this caste system has... Uh, Incorporated, sir. Earlier, I think, I think we lost him again. <laughs> Let's wait a minute. Okay, I'm not too sure whether he's able to join back. Mm. Yeah, he's joined. Okay, Gauri Shankar. Hello, hi. So there uh, was a question. When yes. did the caste system actually start? Mm -hmm. Or in other words, the question was, we had Varna system before. When did the caste system begin? I mean um that that's i think is the question okay uh varna system is uh, is uh, native to indian subcontinent it comes from our earlier thoughts and varna system is actually a social economic system uh which is it, it is an economic system where division of labor 
and total connectivity uh, of uh, or organic growth can happen. But uh, since and and uh, all the traits, for example, the Varna in uh, the Hindu Varna system talks about you know, Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, and Sudra. And uh, our text always talks all four are, all four Varnas are equal, and they are part of a human called the cosmic Purusha. And uh, and different parts shows its um, uh, ability to to run a society. Uh, so, so that's an Indian perspective. What uh, Westerners did is they, I mean, you have to see from um, uh, Eastern lens first. Any, I mean, India never had a system called slaves. We never had slaves, but Abrahamic traditions and Western civilizations always had a concept of slaves. Okay, so that's the basic point. So when Westerners came to India and this and uh, try to understand, they on, they can only see from their own lens. So when they see the text like from Purusha from uh, Purusha Sukta, when uh, when 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 the description in Rig Veda comes, the Brahmana comes from head, uh, the Kshatriya comes from uh, shoulders, Bahu, and the uh, and the ability of uh, and and the vaishyas come from the thighs and the shudras from the feet and they clear and the, immediately they said oh so they the society looks down on uh, on the on the shudras but it says sees uh, brahmana as superior so they created a a indigenous system in their perspective and they made it a uh, uh, as a hierarchical which is uh, completely untrue and uh, dishonest. And, uh, and the stories went like that. So therefore, the actual caste system, what you, what, uh, as, as I understood, actual caste system started in uh, 1780s when the, the concept of uh, something called the Hindu conquest by the missionaries, when they came and tried to convert Indians, they found a huge problem because it every village uh, sub, uh, seems to have its own ecosystem and they could not find a unifying system everywhere because even within villages we have a, a a a goldsmith we have a carpenter we have a potter maker we have uh, a, a a physician we have uh, vaidya we have uh, a, a school gurukula and it, everything is self sustaining somehow and uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, with that diversity, they do not know whom to target. Uh, and the whole village live like a, with a perfect social unit where everyone helps each other. There is no discrimination and nobody do, looks down upon them. To how to break down that society uh, and to, to break down the society and to convert people, the best way is to create a disturbance in them. And that they created by uh, creating this caste system and, uh, and propagating it uh, uh, through education system that one per section of the society is trying to oppress the other. So they created a villain and they, and they, and they said, you are oppressed. And, uh, and, the, and the white people uh, offered themselves as a saviors that we will save you by you convert to Christianity. So that discord, uh, so they used the, the concept of caste system for the conversion and missionary agenda, and that is still continuing today. So uh, whether we want to see from an Indian perspective or a Western perspective, it is up to us. For me, I see Varna system is completely different than fabricated Okay, so we lost uh, Gauri Shankar again. I don't know why it's happening like that today. Perhaps we will uh, bring the session to close uh, because of the interruptions. And uh, uh, 
time is also up for, uh, I think it's almost coming to 8.30. Uh, we'll just wait for him to join and Gauri Shankar, I think we can oh, sorry, bring the I... to a close, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Because yes, uh, yes. it's extended beyond the time. True, 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 true. To finish. true, true, and, true. true. Uh, uh, although this is called day six today, I'm assuming you still have two more topics to cover. One right? more, one more topic. Okay, so tomorrow we already have some other meeting yes. scheduled in the same time. Yes, we can uh, do it some other time. One option is we can um, do this on Monday. Yeah. Because Sunday also, I, I think I've booked uh, something else. Or yes. uh, maybe we'll allow somebody else to use this. Uh, so some yeah. Monday would be a good idea. Yeah. You can kindly just uh, post it in the groups, uh, uh, reminding everyone for the Monday session. Yes, sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you all once again for joining a wonderful session yet again. And uh, uh, we will uh, meet up on Monday for the last and final day. Yeah. Thank you very much. Jai Sri Ram. Jai Sri Ram. Jai Sri Ram, Andy. Thank you. Jai Sri Ram.